In the last video, we thought about how to be able to identify and represent forces and had a quick thought about um, the concept of net force, which is the sum of forces acting on an object. Now we get into the meat of the matter um, of dynamics, uh, Newton's laws of motion. So we will start with his first law. Now, in the history of these laws, it wasn't like Newton completely made these out of whole cloth. Um, there had been workers working on this for the better part of the century prior to him. But while he was uh, hanging out on the family farm away from London, escaping plague, um, he thought deeply about um, the experimental evidence available built off of the ideas that folks had before and developed the model that is still in very wide use today. Um, we'll find that modern physics has caused us to have to add, a, add and twist the things just a little bit, um, but we will find that uh, Newtonian mechanics is very, very resilient. Now, one thing that I have found is that most physics books in an attempt to try to make Newton's laws of motion more accessible um, when they write down Newton's laws they often do it in a way that's maybe a little more confusing so I've just gone back to the idea of just quoting the big guy himself so here we go um, sorry about that I was supposed to be bigger um, let's do that times 36 paste huh. okay so there we go so every now of course technically Newton wrote this all in Latin um, the reason for Latin is that it was the universal language of uh, educated people of the day um, at least in Europe even though nah, even though no one spoke as a native language at this point, um, it was still what everybody was writing in. Um, I went ahead and went for English translation here. Um, so let's go take a look at Every body perseveres in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed thereon. Okay, so what the heck does all that mean? <clears throat> There's a few things. First off, um, he's defining the concept of inertia. So the property of inertia says that it's the natural state of affairs for an object to move at constant velocity and that velocity could include zero. Um, so if some, if you were to put some object in motion, it would just keep going at that speed in that direction forever. Now this is a huge leap to be able to realize this because that doesn't square with our everyday experience very much. Um, in our everyday experience, it seems like, uh, Planes change direction, they slow down. What's, what all's up with that? Well, Newton posits that that's because there are forces involved. And some of these are forces we don't necessarily realize, like because we live in a world full of air, unless you are piloting an aircraft or you're driving a high-speed performance car or riding a bicycle at speed, um, you're probably not too acutely aware of the fact that air is always exerting forces on things. Um, so that tends to skew our, um, our uh, perception of things. The same can be said of the fact that since we live on the surface of a planet, gravity is always pulling down on everything. So if I throw some object, it's going to go in an arc. Um, and this is because of the influence of gravity. So, but, but 
Newton is saying is, okay, let's go out into deep space and then go throw a baseball or something like that. If you're out in deep space, far away from the influence of any object, then the, uh, the baseball would go in a straight line at a constant velocity forever. So that's what our property of inertia is stating. It also operationally defines force. So the correct definition of force um, is, is operationally defined here. Is we say that force is that thing that can change the velocity of an object. Um, so we recognize that force happened because something's velocity changed. All right, and then finally, it uh, defines the idea of an inertial observer. This isn't necessarily immediately obvious from here, but the if you sit and meditate on it for a while, um, it says that any observer who's moving at a constant velocity is uh, permitted to pretend, or well, just to state that they're the one standing still and the whole rest of the world is moving around them. Um, so people might disagree about the velocities of things, but they can do velocity addition to compare notes at the end and everything will be okay. They'll agree on forces and accelerations and things like that in the Newtonian framework. Um, and at first this may seem like crap because you're saying, well, hey, you know, clearly I can tell that I'm moving, but I'll just say, are you so sure? Um, let's say, for instance, you are going down the freeway in some area where the land is flat and the roads are straight. You got the cruise control set. As you're going past wheat field after wheat field after wheat field after wheat field, you ever sometimes just get that feeling that maybe somebody really just kind of conked you out and you woke up in a box and they're just projecting video of wheat fields going past you? Well, that's because you're not feeling your motion. Um, and you could even check this out further if you've, uh, you know, you don't have to drink your beverage any differently in the vehicle or anything like that. Same kind of deal when you're flying in an aircraft, unless um, they're making some sort of a churn or something like that. You pretty much feel like you're just sitting in a room, right? And then and a few hours later, the door to that room opens and you're suddenly in a different city. So, and certainly, you know, when they go and do the beverage service in the aircraft, right, and they, you know, pour that two ounces of that can of pop that you want the whole can for, right? Um, when they pour it, they just, it's basically like they're pouring you know, as if they were in a room. And the only way that you've really got any clue about your motion is if you're to look out the window. But again, for all you know, they might be projecting a video of you flying and you feel the rumble of the uh, jet. But for all you know, they might just be playing some jet noises really loud. And in fact, this is actually how some rides at some uh, theme parks work, is you're just basically stuck into, you know, they, they put you on basically a giant train, move you into a big room, they show you lots of stuff, and it's done in a way where you feel like you're moving around, but you're stationary. And the designers of those rides are relying on the fact that there is nothing in your sensorium that can say whether you are moving at a constant velocity or not. It feels as if you are standing still. And so Newton's saying, 
that's okay. You can, you're even just plain allowed to say you're standing still. The whole rest of the world is moving around you and you are both perfectly entitled to do physics. Um, classic example I can think of that is to say, let's say you were standing right here while I walk past you. while I walk past you. There we go. And as I walk past you, I go ahead and I take a ball and I throw it just straight up out of my hand. You would look at this and say, oh hey, the path of the ball is a parabola. And I would look at it and say that to me, it looks like it's going straight up and down. And so how can we reconcile these two? Well, I say it's straight up and down because as an inertial observer, I'm allowed to say that I'm standing still. And as the ball moves up and down in front of me, I'm moving at the same, you would say I'm moving at the same speed. My velocity is the same as the X component of the ball. Um, so as I measure the distance of the ball in front of me, horizontally never changes. So I conclude it goes up and down. But you would say that since I'm moving and the ball is moving with me horizontally, we have to add that horizontal motion on top of the up and down motion of the ball. And that's why you would see a parabola. Who's right? We're both right. Um, the, the laws of physics um, will both give us our answer. And we can use velocity addition to figure out what the other person would see. So it's totally legit. Okay, on to Newton's second law. So this one, so this one you're going to be using a lot. So again, here, I'm going to give it to you directly as Newton gave it, and then I am going to have to give you a more approximate statement. Um, so as Newton gave it, he said the alteration of momentum is ever proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the straight line in which that force is impressed. Okay, the reason I'm bringing this up, Newton is, what Newton is saying is that the, if I exert a net force on something, um, that that will be equal to the time rate of change of the momentum of an object. Um, the symbol for momentum is usually P, which we haven't defined yet. So we will go back at a later date and uh, use Newton's proper definition. Um, especially when we get concerned with things like the impulse momentum theorem and conservation of momentum and stuff like that. But since we have to start somewhere, we're going to defer momentum for a while. And so I will give you a result that will prove that um, I'm not proving now, but we will prove later. And that's to say that this can be written as the acceleration of an object is equal to the net force exerted on it divided by the object's mass. Now, this is for, there are caveats to this. Um, the biggest caveat for us is that the mass of the thing is constant. If the mass is not constant, we cannot use this 
form of Newton's second law, we would have to use the more sophisticated one that we'll get to later. Um, so this doesn't limit us too badly. The classic things that you, where you'd think about masses changing would be, say, if you look at a raindrop falling down through the sky. As the raindrop falls down, it accretes water molecules, and so the raindrop gets bigger and more massive as it falls down toward the earth. So we have to take into account that its mass is getting bigger. And as an example in the other direction, um, if you launch a rocket, the overwhelming percentage of the mass of the rocket is fuel. The payload is typically only is on the order of a few percent of the mass of the entire rocket stack. The vehicle and payload put together are like on the order of about 10% or so of the mass of the, of the entire rocket plus fuel. So the fuel is like the lion's share of the vehicle. And there is a joke in rocketry. Um, what is the difference between a rocket and a bomb? About two and a half minutes. Um, if, it ex if it explodes faster than two and a half minutes, it was a bomb. And then you have what uh, rocket people call a RUD, which stands for Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. Oh, and if the explosion happens in two and a half minutes or so, congratulations, the first stage got the uh, second stage and the payload up to um, the, up to the altitude of close to low Earth orbit. So the point being is you're burning an awful lot of fuel awfully fast. The mass is very much not changing or is very much changing, I should say. And to analyze either the raindrop or the rocket, you would have to use the methods of calculus. In the case of um, the rocket, that would lead to what are called Solovsky's first and second rocket equations. All right. So that's the one caveat. The other caveat here is that things are non-relativistic. So this means that the speed of the object is substantially less than the speed of light. The symbol for speed of light is C. Me writing two less than signs means that's much less than the speed of light. Um, and this turns out to be true for pretty much everything in your entire existence, including things like the speeds of electrons and atoms and stuff like that. Pretty much everything goes at speeds slow enough that we don't have to take relativistic corrections into account. The one difference, the, the one case where it mattered, it is a historical one that doesn't matter so much anymore. Now that we all have nice uh, L LED or LCD flat screen TVs, um, we have lost out on our chance to have something relativistic in our living rooms. Um, in the era of color, when color television sets used picture tubes, um, the picture tube fired an electron to hit the phosphorus on the end on the other end of the tube which would light up the color um, so and make it glow so that you could see the image. Um, the electrons that got fired in a color TV set <coughs> were going at relativistic speeds and so the designers of color TVs did have to take Einstein's corrections into account um, or more correctly Einstein's redefinition of momentum into account. Um, oddly with black and white TVs, there you could pretend that the, the electron was going at uh, classical speeds and everything was just fine. So pretty much everything in our existence goes much less than the speed of light. 
So this is not a huge constraint. Now, as far as units go, our units of force. Well, um, the, the SI unit is the Newton, named after Sir Isaac. The symbol is a capital N. And one Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So we can see that by looking at this here. We need to get meters per second squared. So what would the units of something of our force be if after we divide it by kilograms for our mass, we end up with meters per second squared? Well, it'd have to be kilograms times meters per second squared. This combination occurs so frequently that we have what they call a derived unit, the Newton. Um, basically as an abbreviation to uh, keep us from uh, going totally nuts, writing kilogram meter per second squared all the time. All right, let's just do a couple quick examples of this just to get, get a feel for this. So let's just start by saying that um, I am pushing so I guess that's, well, it's not me pushing very well, is it? Um, let's try that a little better. Okay, I tried. There, there's my hand. Okay. I am pushing on a box with, let's say, 10 newtons of force. And let's say the box has a mass of 2 kilograms what will be the resultant acceleration of the object? Well, these are vector quantities. So this is my force vector F, that is my acceleration vector A. And because they are proportional through a positive scalar M, the mass, the force and the acceleration, the, the, the net force and the acceleration always point in the same direction. In this case here, there's only one force acting on the box um, that we're worrying about here. So that'd be just the force of my push. So there's my free body diagram. It's got to accelerate the same way as the net force. So we can say, all right, in magnitude, A will equal F net over M. The only force I got is just that force. So let's go and put it in. So 10 newtons over two kilograms. And let's just expand the units out to make sure that we're feeling good about this 10 kilogram meters per second squared over two kilograms, cancel, cancel. We get five meters per second squared, which is what we expect for a force. All right. Let's do a more complicated example. Um, so let's say here that um, I'm pushing on my box again. We'll go ahead and make the mass of the box two kilograms again. Um, this time I'm going to be pushing on the box Hey, I can do a better job of drawing me pushing. All right, that makes me very happy. Um, this time I'm pushing on the box with a five Newton force. We will say that the box was initially at rest. And we will also say that I pushed on the box for two seconds. So at the end of my pushing, I would like to know how far did I push it and how fast is it moving? So let's go back to star situation tools, answer review. So I've just done the situation here. I drew a picture. I identified all of my unknowns 
or all my knowns, and I have identified what I was asked to find. All right, so now for tools, I want to show you a trick here because this is a little more complicated of a problem than what we've been doing before. Before, we could always just jump straight to the equation that, okay, maybe we'd have to rearrange to get the thing we needed, but we could just pick an equation by identifying missing variables and call it a day. A lot of times when you look at work solutions of problems, um, the way to understand the thought process that went behind the solution is almost to look at the problem backwards. So here's what I mean by that. When I look at this, if I didn't have the force and the mass here, I'd just be looking at this and saying, oh, velocity is zero. I want to know what final velocity is. Oh, yeah, I'm given a time. That screams kinematics. But then you realize I'm asking for two signs. And so that means that I'm missing. I, I, I have too many variables that are missing. Um, because the only thing I've given you directly is the time. We, we know the time. It's two seconds. We're being asked for position, final position. We're being asked for final speed. It's like, crap. In order for this to work, I need one other piece of information. How the heck am I going to get that? And it seems like the only other piece of information that would be available would be if I could somehow... get the acceleration. Because you do know that, okay, the thing's accelerating to the right. We know that. It started at rest and now it's moving. So if we could somehow get A, then life would be good. So then you look at that and you say, well, how could I get A? Okay, I need another tool. In this case, I have available Newton's second law of motion. So if I so now I've thought about the problem backwards. I thought about what was the very last step that I needed to do. The very last step I needed to do was do some kinematics to get V and to get X. But then I had to think, okay, now what did I have to do in order to get that step? What I had to do there was Newton's second law of motion to get the acceleration. Okay, so now I've thought backwards. And now I can solve forwards. So let's go into the answer part. And so this is where I'm going to be solving forwards. So we'll start with Newton's second law of motion. That tells me that in the that the acceleration is equal to the net force over the mass. Here we're just going to be looking at in the x direction. So then the acceleration is directed purely along x, so the x component is easy to find. The only force I have is the force of my push over m. Great. I know the force, I know the mass. I'm good to go. I now know the acceleration. Now that I know the acceleration, I can say solve for, um, let's solve for V first. Um, I can solve for V by, um, now I have the acceleration by using the missing X. equation, right? That one's going to tell me that V is equal to V initial plus AT. All right, V initial is zero. So my acceleration from here is F over M times the time. All right, let's go and put in the numbers. So the force is going to be 5 newtons over 2 kilograms. 
a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, so cancel, cancel. I'll be timesing by two seconds. That cancels one of those. Hey, I'm left with meters per second. And more to the point, it's going at five meters per second. All right. Now, I still need to solve for the final position. And now the problem is actually what's called overspecified. Because you know x, you now know v, you know a, and you know t. There's nothing missing. So what the heck do you do when there's nothing missing? You go with whichever one you feel is the easiest to do. In this case, I'm just going to pick, and you can make a different choice, and that choice would be okay. The one I'm going to pick is the missing a equation. So that one says that x is equal to x naught, which x naught is zero, plus one half v naught, which is zero, plus v times t. So this will be one half times five meters per second times two seconds, cancel, cancel. Hey, we get five meters as well. So I kind of already did the unit check as I was going through here. So we've already done that part of the review process. So then we just ask ourselves, is this plausible? Yeah, I mean, five newtons isn't pushing terribly hard. That's about a half a pound or so. Um, and those seem like kind of plausible speeds if I were to in distances if I were to push on something for a couple of seconds. So that seems to square with our um, um, intuition. So yeah, we'll say it's plausible. Alrighty. So with that, in the next video, I'm going to get into a bit of a subtlety about mass. So catch you in the next one.